Welcome to the Micah Brown Podcast, where we have the most authentic conversations you've ever heard on a podcast. I get the privilege of talking with amazing people every week in a way that lets us really get to know them as a fellow human being, whether it's a CEO, a military service member, an entrepreneur, a former convict, a teacher, a medical professional, or even a university president. They're all just fellow human beings at the end of the day. So join us as we discuss life, obstacles, successes, and much more. Don't forget to subscribe, share, like, and follow. This show is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, pages on all of those. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn where I post things pretty frequently. The Facebook page is Micah Brown Podcast, while both Instagram and Twitter are at Actual MVP. And I'm pretty sure even if you look on Facebook at Actual MVP, you'll be able to find the correct page. This podcast exists to promote genuine, authentic conversations, which lead to, spoiler alert, genuine, authentic relationships. Simply put, we need to post more, talk less. The more this message gets out, the more positive change we can affect in the world. There are three main ways to support this movement and effort. Number one, support your own knowledge and entertainment by going to audibletrial.com forward slash MBP and get your free 30-day trial. Number two, go to coffee.com, except it's spelled weird. It's ko-fi.com forward slash actual MVP to become a direct supporter. Or finally, number three, become a patron through my webpage by going to microbrownpodcast.podbean.com. Or since that's a lot of links and you're probably just listening to this driving in a car or showering or working out or doing something where you can't use your phone right away, you can just go to any of those social media accounts when you get a chance and look at the link tree where you can find all the direct links there. Now, let's get to our conversation for this week. My guest today is David Olive who has more than 30 years experience in business, politics, law, and public affairs. He has served formerly as the chief of staff to U.S. Representative Asa Hutchinson and was a former staffer for U.S. Senator Jim Allen. Upon leaving Capitol Hill, Mr. Olive oversaw the aviation, antitrust, telecommunications, and information technology practice group as senior vice president of the public affairs firm, Powell Tate. That was a mouthful. And I can promise uh, his job was just as complicated in that role. In 1999, he left Powell Tate to develop a government relations practice built around helping business businesses interact with federal and state governments. Before coming to Washington, we're going backwards here. Before coming to Washington, Mr. Olive served as president of Care First Inc., a nursing home management company in Fort Smith, Arkansas. He also directed the legal division of the Don Ray Media Group, a multi-state publishing, real estate, and advertising firm. He served on the board and was president of the Fort Smith Rotary Club, the Fort Smith Boys Shelter, and helped start Leadership Fort Smith, all in Arkansas. Prior to moving to Arkansas, Mr. Olive practiced law as a partner in the Birmingham, Alabama firm of McMillan and Spratling. There, he had a general civil practice specializing in news media, risk mitigation, employment law, and insurance defense. However, his first case won was against his sister, my mom, when at a very young age, he convinced her that any of her piggy bank coins marked with a D obviously belonged to him. She later figured out that that means for Denver Mint and is seeking to be um, paid back with significant interest. Mr. Olive clerked for U.S. District Judge Clarence W. Allgood after earning his Juris Doctor at the Cumberland School of Law and received his bachelor's degree from Samford University. He has taught at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, University of Montevallo in Montevallo, Alabama, and Webster University, Fort Smith in Arkansas. As if that wasn't enough, Mr. Olive is a fellow at the George Washington University Center for Cyber and Homeland Security, He also established and currently serves as the moderator of the Washington Homeland Security Roundtable and is a frequent contributor to Security Debrief, a Homeland Security blog. In 2005, The Hill newspaper named Mr. Olive one of the top Homeland Security lobbyists in Washington, D.C. Finally, 
Mr. Olive is the managing partner of Catalyst Partners in Washington, D.C., where his practice has a strong emphasis on homeland security and development of defense security related matters, including Safety Act designations and certifications. Please welcome my guest, my friend, and my uncle, David Olive. David, thank you so much for joining the Micro Brown podcast today. I know you are uh, an hour earlier than us, so it's about lunchtime there in DC. How's the day going? How's the week gone? How are you feeling? I, it is a weird week in Washington, but then in uh, uh, any election year, it is always a weird week. Take that and add to it a pandemic flu, a Congress that hasn't passed a budget, um, and uh, a baseball season that didn't allow fans in the stands. And I th- think I can generally say that 2020 is probably the personification of Murphy's Law in every possible way you can think of it. So, I think but otherwise, 20- I'm doing well. <laughs> I think 2020 is the strangest decade any of us have experienced. Yeah, I, I think we've <laughs> celebrated, you know, five times anniversary just for one 12-month period. So. Yep. <laughs> Man, well, outside of the baseball and obviously the pandemic, um, it doesn't sound much like much has changed in D.C. Uh, you know, usually tumultuous things happen and they all kind of centralize around the main core of D.C. So... I'm glad that you're you're staying um, just floating along with all of it, even down some rapids, just going right along. Yes, sir. And Trying to. Even right now, uh, as we speak, I know one of the ways that the pandemic has affected, for better or worse, uh, your company is that you're moving out of your office and, and tr- starting to go remote. So um, do you see that as kind of like a positive? Do you see that as just a new variable that, you're now embracing or how do you feel about that just as a whole, as a business perspective? Well, I mean, there's, you know, there's a part of uh, what you do in Washington that depends upon your ability to have in-person meetings or it used to, uh, to go to trade shows, seminars, conferences, and meet people that you otherwise would not get a chance to meet Uh, with the government. Now, not doing any in-person meetings uh, because most of the workforce that I would deal with are working from home or working remotely. Um, There just isn't really a need for office space when 90% of what I can do today can be done online, whether it's Zoom, Microsoft Teams, any meeting, Ubiity. I think I counted last week. I now have 15 different video conference applications that only, various only 15. people use. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it seems like there's a new one every week that somebody uses for cybersecurity purposes or because their company invented it. So learning to adapt and uh, go uh, with whatever the circumstances are is kind of what I've done my entire life and not being afraid to look at things that cause you have to change and cause it to be an opportunity, I guess, has just kind of always been my uh, outlook. Uh, as you well know, my mother had a sign on her bathroom wall that was a dandelion growing in the crack of a uh, sidewalk. And the, uh, you know, the, the writing underneath it said, bloom where you're planted. And that is kind of been a guiding principle for all of us that you can't you can't change the circumstances in life but you can change how you react to them and that's that's what we're trying to do now and who knows uh we may go back to five years ten years to an office environment but uh, i think by that time i'll be checked out and in the uh, in one of the assisted living facilities if i'm that lucky <laughs> I, I find that hard to believe. Uh, I, I feel like you're going to stay busy until someone puts you in a hospital and you're like, they say you literally are not allowed to leave here. <laughs> yeah. There For your are, own there health. Are, <laughs> there are certain members of the family who you may know that accuse me of being the guy who's in the hearse with the 
smartphones saying, could you drive around one more time so I can finish this email before they uh, uh, intern me? So, that is an accurate accusation. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, and I don't shy away from it. So, uh, no, that or, or you would say, you know, you could have turned left there. Get uh-huh. us there a little bit faster. Or the, oh, there's a place over here. You need to check this out. That's I always great. try to be helpful. <laughs> well, David, Uncle David, as uh, I have already told the audience, I would love for you to share some of your background. Who knows? I might learn a new thing or two um, listening to this, but just some background, um, maybe some more specifics than I've already shared in the intro, uh, but just kind of where you grew up how you went from Birmingham, Alabama, all the way up to D.C. and the roundabout route in which you got there? Well, it's a, um, uh, it's a long and sordid story, uh, and I'll try to make it as brief as is possible for someone with my ability to uh, stretch out uh, information. Uh, born in Birmingham, uh, grew up... Uh, uh, in the Woodlawn Crestwood area, went to undergraduate school uh, at Samford University, went, finished in three years, went to law school, clerked for a federal judge, got out, worked in a law firm where one of my partners was uh, a state representative, then state senator, then lieutenant governor of Alabama, and ran for governor against George Wallace and um, lost in the closest race George Wallace had ever uh, run, running for governor. Um, I worked my way through school working for a TV station. Uh, My boss uh, was a brigadier general in the Army Reserve named Everett Holly, one of the great mentors of the thousands that I've had in my life. And he taught me, number one, that he had never learned anything from someone who agreed with him. So be open to people with different viewpoints. Number two is that he said in studying management, and he had an MBA in management, is that the key to success was to surround yourself with people who are better than you are. And he looked me square in the eye and said, David, in your case, that's not going to be real hard. And I was so stupid. I thought it was a compliment at first until I realized exactly what he had said. (laughs) One of those times where you you hear it, but then you play it back in your head later and you go, wait a second. Yeah. Uh, But the reality is he was exactly right. I have been blessed for, for decades of being able to surround myself with people who are far better uh, than I am. But I practiced law and did mostly media work in Birmingham. And then in the mid eighties, got an opportunity to go be in-house counsel for uh, the third largest newspaper chain at the time in the United States. Uh, I told people that being an in-house lawyer was a whole lot more fun than being an outhouse lawyer. Um, The primary reason for that is when you are in-house, you are focused on preventing problems rather than as in private practice where you're more of the fireman and you get called after there's some crisis. Uh, And so it really helped put me on the course of uh, kind of my mission in life is to help people prevent problems. And the subject matter has changed many times. Uh, I continued to work for the newspaper company called the Don Ray Media Group until Mr. Reynolds passed away and we sold it. And then I got an opportunity to become president of a nursing home management chain and did that for two years and we sold it. And that was right at the time this little political calamity called Whitewater occurred and all the dominoes that fell caused Mike Huckabee to become the governor of Arkansas. Um, He had been running for Senate, so the Senate seat was open, and then Congressman Tim Hutchinson uh, ran for Senate, was elected, but that created an opening in Tim's House seat, and Tim's younger brother, Asa, ran for the House, and both of them got elected, so Tim took all of his staff over to the Senate, and Asa had to build a staff, and I think in a, a... moment of bad judgment, asked me to come and be his chief of staff. That was uh, my first trip to Washington in that role was November of 1996, when we came up for the new members orientation. Uh, And then he was sworn in January 1, 97. uh, And I've now 
been here ever since. He's, I stayed with him um, for a little over a year and then got an opportunity to join a Washington, D.C. public affairs firm known as Powell Tate, run by Jody Powell, Jimmy Carter's former press secretary, and Sheila Tate, Nancy Reagan's press secretary. And I handled their high-tech aviation and antitrust practice groups uh, and loved what I was doing and represented a huge number of IT companies that were uh, advocating the Justice Department look into Microsoft's uh, antitrust behavior. Um, one of those companies was a little firm called Travelocity, uh, then a startup. Uh, fast forward to June of 2001, and um, I had left Powell Tate and started basically my own firm, uh, had two clients, the Washington National Cathedral and Travelocity, and September 11th occurred, and of course, the national airspace was shut down because of the terrorist attacks. Several of the hijackers had bought their tickets through Travelocity, and Travelocity had the FBI in their offices that afternoon wanting to know how many people flew on the airplanes that were the weapons of mass destruction on 9-11. Where did they sit? How did they pay for it? How many times had they flown previously with the same people? Basically all the data analytics. And with the national airspace system shut down, the mission literally changed in an instant to how do you make it safe for people to travel? And more importantly, how do you make it so that they feel safe to travel? One well, of the lessons- I know that- You've talked to me about the difference between, and I'd love for you to touch on this very quickly, the difference between security and safety. Sure. So, and, so, and now now you're adding a different element of whether or not you feel safe, despite sure. if you are. So, you, typically you think of safety as an item that can be fixed, and once it is fixed, that it stays fixed. You have a flat tire, you go fill it up, you replace the tire, you don't have to do that every time you get in your car. Uh, if there's a technology glitch or whatever it is, that is considered a safety function. Security, on the other hand, um, particularly when you're dealing with an adaptive adversary, means that you're constantly having to look at the systems and processes and people that you have in place so as uh, to make sure that you've built a layered system that makes it hard for that adversary to penetrate the boundaries that you've set. That can be in the physical space, can be in the cyberspace. Um, literally, it can be in uh, doing internal audits and checks of employees with sensitive proprietary information. Um, but the idea is that safety tends to be something that's fixable and security is something that has to be continuously monitored, addressed, uh, and changed to meet the demands of an adaptive adversary. And that, of course, doesn't, that's, that's the actual security. That doesn't deal with the perception of security, because no matter how secure we can make an airplane today, and I say secure from a, uh, from a uh, cleaning and hygienic standpoint, if people don't want to get on those airplanes because they're afraid the other passengers might infect them with the coronavirus, they're not going to fly, no matter what you do to the physical surroundings. So you have to deal with both, both the perception as well as the substantive reality. And, it, and so from what- that, that I was going to say that then brings me up to the current uh, firm where uh, we have uh, a group of people who are different subject matter experts, but are all focused on helping clients either do business with the federal government in the homeland security, homeland defense space, keep the government out of their space from a regulatory standpoint, or level the playing field where they can compete for business uh, in the space and take advantage of the tremendous research and development capabilities the private sector can bring to help the federal government meet its mission to make us safe and more secure. And that's always a, an interesting seesaw, if you will, of regulation versus non-regulation or deregulation, because sometimes it's a political 
move of just, oh, look, the federal government's doing something about it. And then other times it's actually, no, the federal government needs to fully step in and regulate whatever new thing is coming up, which we've seen that just in my lifetime with internet and then social media. Does social media need to be regulated by the government to some degree or does it not? Um, Is there some way that the social media companies can regulate that themselves? So you're talking about it from uh, a homeland security and a cyber cyber security perspective. And uh, that's, that's an ever evolving playing field, which is why you're quite frankly, constantly on your phone because things happen every minute uh, of the day and things can change at the drop of a hat. Well, back to your earlier comment about the difference between safety and security. Safety is something that can in fact lend itself to a regulatory scheme because it's a one and done and accountable type of type of situation. Security is almost impossible to regulate simply because it changes so fast and the government wheels of its regulatory bureaucracy move so slow. So it may take uh, a federal agency three or four years to write regulations. It may take Congress longer than that if they can ever agree on anything. Uh, and, uh, and you cannot do Homeland Security at the speed of bureaucracy. So no. the best thing, in my view, is to incentivize the private sector and incentivize government entities to act, to be proactive. Uh, which is one of the reasons why we got involved with what's known as the Safety Act, which is a government-sanctioned program capping the liability for people who sell anti-terrorism technology or products and services, because it is not a regulatory scheme. It is a voluntary scheme, and it is one where the private sector uh, can choose to apply, uh, can basically set their own terms as to what is effective uh, and it's not subject to the years if not decades long regulatory oversight and uh, inability to adapt the, that is necessary when you're dealing with security in the you know I've spent some time working with you and trying to learn about the safety act and what does that actually mean and whenever people whenever people have asked me even recently, you know, what does your uncle do? Or you come up in conversation and, oh, the Safety Act is something that he specializes in and um, helps companies navigate or entities, whatever you want to call them, navigate that process. Um, and the way I explain the Safety Act in very simple terms is it's a government sponsored insurance policy. Where And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, my understanding is that if a terrorist attack was to happen, let's say at Yankee Stadium, where the, they've walked through all this whole arduous process and make sure they're covered through the Safety Act, they have a cap at which they're liable. Um, and so that's why I explain it as like an insurance policy. They qualify for this major insurance policy. If something were to happen, then they're covered because they've taken extra measures and steps to secure, <laughs> secure Yankee stadium and then help people feel safe because of that. So uh, that's close enough for uh, <laughs> general purposes. Uh, you know, it, uh, it, It is not an insurance policy as such, but insurance, private insurance is implicated. So um, let me see if I can explain it real briefly. If you are a defense contractor and you produce a product or service that meets the requirements of the Department of Defense, the law says you stand in the shoes of the Defense Department, and you get the equivalent of sovereign immunity, meaning the government can't be sued for its own actions without the government's consent, and you get what's known as a government contractor defense. So that is basically a complete immunity from lawsuits. On the other hand, if 
you are a vaccine manufacturer and you know that no matter what you do, that there's still going to be some popu- some percentage of the population, no matter how small, that is going to get have an adverse reaction to your vaccine, even if it is effective for 99.95% of the population. The government will step in under what's called Public Law 85804 and indemnify you as the vaccine manufacturer, meaning that anyone who is injured is paid not by the private company, but by the federal government, because the government has decided it is in the overall country's best interest to protect 99.95% of the population. And we will deal with the outliers directly by indemnifying the company. When the Safety Act was considered, it literally passed the House of Representatives by one vote. And the, the argument was, should it be a liability cap or should it be an indemnity prov- uh, provision? And Congress decided, led by the then majority leader of the House, a guy from the state of Texas named Dick Armey, that he was not going to open the, he didn't believe it was right to open the entire U.S. Treasury to claims of uh, that anti-terrorism technology didn't work. And he wanted to incentivize companies. So they built a scheme that's a liability cap. And it caps your liability at the amount of insurance that you carry. And the day after Congress passed the Safety Act as part of the when it stood up the Department of Homeland Security. The very next day they passed what was called the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act and created a backstop uh, for private sector insurance carriers to insure risks of terrorism related activities. Before that, after 9-11, every major insurance company in the world excluded coverage for acts of terrorism because the the liability was just too big. So in essence, they came in, the federal government came in and said, if there's an act of terrorism in the United States and the private insurance companies will insure up to a certain point, then the federal government will step in and cover the, the rest, almost like an excess carrier. So it's not really insurance, it's not indemnity, but it's more like a reinsurance uh, clause. And I know you've previously interviewed folks who are in the insurance business and they'll understand the technical terms, but it is a wonderful program that even though we got down in the weeds as to kind of distinctions, uh, it is a wonderful program because uh, it does not allow punitive damages and whatever Safety Act coverage a client gets, their clients also get the benefit of it, as well as the suppliers of the component parts or services that they produce, upstream and downstream liability protection. And there are very few other aspects of liability protection in all of the federal government that give that breadth of coverage that the Safety Act does. And it, so it's it's a great thing. It, it has broad coverage, but isn't it quite a um, gauntlet, especially if you don't know what you're doing, a gauntlet to walk through to get that coverage? That was sure. my understanding, that it, there were yes. quite a few steps, and you had to make sure you crossed your T's and dotted your I's to make sure you pass it all. And And the reason for that is the burden is on the applicant, to show that the technology or service is effective at identifying, detecting, deterring, responding to or recovering from an act of terrorism. It's not up to the government. It is, they do not accept marketing materials that say, we are the world's best camera or object recognition video. They say, no, you have to prove that and you have to prove effectiveness and it's largely a paper review. So there have been applications filed for major real estate uh, development, soft targets, office buildings, stadiums, like you mentioned, 
that will go into the thousands of pages because of the necessity to prove effectiveness of every part of that system. And you don't get coverage unless you can prove effectiveness uh, other than one special category where they give you a three-year period to go out and deploy a brand new technology that's being developed uh, so you can go out and test it in real life circumstances and they'll protect you in those cases uh, as well. But Which I'm sure is something you've dealt with, right? The new technology sure. oh, yeah. piece. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The DTED. So Michael, we look at it as, um, as helping be a Sherpa or in your own case, uh, you know that people can go to the gym and work out, but they get a much better result when they have a knowledgeable trainer that can help them go through and do things in the right way rather than the wrong way uh, and wind up kind of wasting their time or not helping them. And, and that's pretty much uh, kind of the way we view our role is any, any entity can apply on their own, but it goes much faster and there's a higher chance of success if you get somebody to help you along the way. Yeah. And, and there's so many roles like that in life that are guides, if you will. Um, you said Sherpa, which is a guide to climb Mount Everest specifically, but, um, and I think they may call that for other mountains, but either way, uh, personal trainer is a great example of one that I've recently discovered is a customer success I don't know if it's a manager or supervisor or whatever, but basically once a customer has purchased software of some sort or some product, you come in and help them understand how to use that. So the example I used is what you just said. You walk into a gym, say New Year's resolution, you bought this gym membership and you walk in and just feel like you've jumped in the deep end and don't know how to swim. Uh, so personal trainer is a great avenue to say, how do I actually utilize this? So in this case, you would be the personal trainer. People that you work with would be the personal trainers to help people understand here, here's what you do need to focus on. Here's what you don't need to focus on. And maybe not yet, maybe later, but um, I, I would love to pivot real quick and, and come back before we continue down that road. Uh, not to, I am very interested in this answer, but I feel like the people listening would also be very interested. Favorite question to ask what obstacles or events in your life have most shaped your character or who you are as a person and how? And again, you can offer as many examples as you'd like or as few. It's up to you. Do you want me to talk about those just that I faced today, this week? Or Probably this the, week, the, yeah. The that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Let's go with highlights, highlights over the lifetime. I, I think probably – the answer to that is every time I have made a career change, walking into an unknown situation and not having that level of confidence that I know exactly what is going to happen, because it is basic human nature uh, to mitigate risk and um, to not go into things that you don't know, right? Um, and specifically, when I was having to decide, do I leave this career of being a lawyer that I had studied hard for and planned basically all of my life to do, had achieved some level of success and recognition and uh, including winning Supreme Court cases on behalf of uh, reporters and editors and TV stations and negotiating cable rates and on and on and on, and go into the nursing home management business where I literally didn't know anything about nursing home operations. And, and I had a great aunt that was in a nursing home, and that was, that was literally all I knew. And the guy who hired me, said, David, we're not hiring you to be the nurse. And when you work in a nursing home, it is a highly regulated environment, and your knowledge of how to read and interpret regulations is a skill set that you will find helpful. Number two, it is uh, a high-risk 
environment. No one ever wants to solve a problem that has occurred in a nursing home. You want to prevent that problem from ever happening. And you have a skill set in knowing how to prevent problems. Uh, and number three is you know how to work and build teams and communicate with people at different levels, whether it's the political apparatus that is necessary to trans, uh, you know, to go through in order to get a certificate of need, or the nursing home, or the staff, or the family members, or the support groups. Uh, and he said, you do what you do best in those skill sets. We'll do the nursing, we'll do the accounting, we'll do the, uh, the other stuff. And I can tell you that two year period taught me more about being adaptive to new changes than possibly anything that I'd ever, ever done. Um, and so when we sold the nursing home and not knowing what to do, um, you know, the bluebird flew in the window uh, of being able to come to Washington as chief of staff. Um, I'd been here 25 years earlier, basically as an intern and as an assistant press secretary. And I said my only qualifications to be chief of staff is I knew my way through the tunnels underneath the U.S. Capitol. Um, Which I can attest was, is actually a very handy skill. <laughs> yeah, but it was, you know, but it was also a constituent base, try to avoid problems, try to bring people together, skill set. Uh, and I think that people... The thing that I, th I think too many people view their skill set as their occupation, as opposed to what has helped me get through the hurdles is go back to your core skills. What do you do that people would find valuable? And in my case, it boils down to five words is that I help people prevent problems. And I help. I'm a helper. I don't do it myself. I love working with people. Prevention is far more valuable than having to go in and solve it. Although sometimes you have to solve a problem to prevent future ones. And I love the challenge of, of being able to work on a problem. It does not matter what the subject is, whether it is removing algae from a pond, whether it is doing biometric identification, whether it is um, helping develop vaccines and, and logistics, uh, to distribute them, whether it is building a campaign on uh, cybersecurity and education, uh, all those things in my life have all kind of added to allow me to have the confidence, plus kind of being a person who uh, is, you know, grounded in faith, and faith is evidence of those things which are not seen, which you can't put your finger on. Uh, but you believe that it's going to be right. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't create anxiety. I'm telling you, uh, you know, 2020 has been the most anxiety-ridden year of my entire tenure here in Washington, and that includes two presidential impeachments, a government shutdown, and a terrorist attack. Um, but just kind of having that faith that your skill sets can help other people is what has sustained me through those through those hurdles. Just to kind of draw a, a line through, well, to find the common thread is a better way to put it, through everything that you've just said, as some encouragement to people listening right now. If you're looking back, especially if you're probably my age or maybe a few years younger, and you're looking at what seems to be an odd line of jobs where none of them are the exact same, in your case, it sounds like you know, you grew up planning to be a lawyer. That was the goal. That was what you worked hard towards. Um, even the, the steps you took immediately after getting your JD. But then fast forward, and now you're in a completely different role. And to look back, as you've just helped us do, to look back on your life and look at the different jobs that you've had, it's almost like because of your willingness to just embrace those new adventures, embrace those new roles and try to find those nuggets that you can cling to and take with you. That's now cultivated you into a very unique position that not many people can um, say they're 
skilled for. So the companies that then come to you for advice that you consult for or the startup companies that you're investing in both in, in money, but also in your own brain and the, the advice that you can input and the, the wisdom that you can hand off, that's a unique place that I would say very few people uh, can, can claim as their job and be skilled at. I think that a lot of people want to get there, but it's kind of like saying, I, I want to learn how to play the drums. Correction, you want to play the drums. You do not want to practice and constantly get blisters on your fingers and your muscles hurt in weird ways. You don't want to do that. You just want to like matrix style plug in and suddenly you know how to play drums. So the encouragement that I'm pointing out here, the common thread is that your life is a great example of we may not know what the future holds for us, but as we walk through these things that seem to sometimes be disconnected, they might actually be stringing together a perfect skill set for something ideal in the future that literally only you are capable of doing, that no one else is going to be capable of doing. So uh, just a pause for some encouragement. Anybody that currently in 2020, you're feeling very stressed out, um, maybe just hold tight to that hope that Maybe this is exactly what is cultivating you into an amazing person that only you can be. Well, uh, you know, it, it, the humble brag would be that I don't feel like I'm unique um, in any respect because I think there are a lot of people who have that same skill set or could develop that same skill set. And yet, I think it was Margaret Mead who said that the great thing about people is that they're all unique, just like everyone else. And, you know, the, the conundrum of that is we are all individually unique, but I would, I'll take a 15 degree turn from your comments. One of the things that I enjoyed most about being a lawyer is lawyers rarely represent other lawyers. They represent clients. And in order to represent a client, you have to understand them, their problems, their business, and for whatever reason, I got this hyperactive curiosity gene, and so I just Oh, love, it's your fault. That, I've been wondering where that is, came from. It is my fault, and I just thrive on learning new things. So as a lawyer, one of the very first things that I ever did is worked with a civil engineering firm that was laying out a rural water project. And today I could go and help a team lay out a rural water system because I just immersed myself in it. Um, is that a water joke? The great, the, uh, <laughs> I did, I thought Too easy. Given up, thought you'd given up drinking. Um, the you know, the, the reality is, though, is that in everything I've done, uh, it is that curiosity factor and the willingness to be open to new things and keep learning that is the thread that goes through it all. So whether it is being a lawyer, being a, a, a private practice lawyer, an in-house lawyer, um, a, um, a nursing home guy, a mediator, a chief of staff, a uh, public affairs guy, a uh, homeland security specialist. Uh, one of the best compliments that I ever received, I think, was from a lobbyist uh, who'd been a lobbyist for the Boeing company for over 30 years. And we went to lunch one day and he said, David, he says, I don't understand you. You know more about the Boeing company than I do. And I've worked here for over 30 years. And I looked at him and I said, Paul, I don't understand why all your consultants don't know as much about the Boeing company as they could in order to be helpful. Because the great thing about an outside consultant is we can look horizontally across a range of problems, whereas employees tend to work in verticals and kind of work within their little stovepipes or cylinders of excellence or whatever it's called, and they don't have the chance to look horizontally across the system. Um, and so uh, curiosity, I think, is, and that constant willingness to learn is the thread 
that goes through no matter what you do, because you never know when something will be helpful. You really never know. Uh, but be open to it, right? And I think that's one of the things that we try to teach anybody that works here, whether it's an intern uh, or, you know, somebody that's come out of government and has a deep specialty is look beyond the boundaries of what you're currently working on. Uh, and that, I think you, whenever I entered with you, um, the way you posed that idea to me of saying, look beyond the boundaries you're currently working within, um, you said, Micah, there will be things you learned this summer that you don't realize you learned until years from now. And Was it true? I would say it's partly true. Um, I, I think this many years removed, uh, it's not that I didn't realize the lessons I learned. It's more about application that I learned the application, I, the application was what was different. So I knew the lesson I had learned, but then how do I apply it to my new stage of life with teaching? How do I apply it with being a husband? How do I apply it with being a dad? How do I apply it with being a financial planner? When I switched from teaching to financial planning, I remember you telling me we were, uh, as interns, we were working on a presentation for Union Pacific. Uh, one of which that by the time we were actually done with it, something occurred in the federal government and then our whole presentation was pointless. But what, when I came to you and I was used to college professors saying, here are your parameters. Here's how you need to have this done. This kind of font, this many slides, blah, blah, blah. You, we, we went to you, I think it was Amy and I came to you and said, David, how would you like this accomplished? And we're standing by a desk. You grab a piece of paper and you set it in front of us and you say, start with this. And I, I flipped the paper over. There was nothing on the paper at all. And he said, just start with this. That's a great example of the lesson is sometimes it's scary the first time, but sometimes it's best when somebody gives you an open floor to literally just create off of your own flavor in your own mind and go from there. Now the application that I didn't realize till years later was switching jobs or becoming a parent for the first time, that's the blank piece of paper. People give you ideas, but you internalize that. You have the capability, and I'm saying you to people listening, but you have the capability in your own mind to piece together um, different parts of a, of a variety of puzzles and then create your own art piece. So to me, when I jumped into financial planning, I took input from other people. How did you do it? How did you acquire clients? How did you actually interact with them? And then I thought, if I had a blank piece of paper right now, how would this look? How would I draw it out? So to circle back, your, your question was, is it true? Um, I think that the lessons I learned, I've realized all those by now, but the application continues to change. It does. And uh, I, even though he was uh, widely uh, quoted uh, for his famous quad chart, the four by four, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, known knowns, known unknowns, unknown knowns, and unknown unknowns, right? Uh, and how you kind of put information in. Uh, the quadrant that is the most important is the unknown knowns. Those things that you don't realize that you know until you actually need them. Um, I, for example, uh, the nursing home business, when they audit you, they come in with a, a legal pad and three or four pages of things that you're supposed to be doing. And if any of those things are wrong, then you are deemed to be a deficient operator. So the best that you will ever be when you get audited by the government is the best you'll ever be is non-deficient. Now, when you think about it, it is really hard to motivate people to be non-deficient, right? I mean, you want to give them something to shoot for. Hey, let's, you know, everybody gather up. We're going around today. We're not going to be deficient in anything. Well, that's, that's a very hard lesson to try to teach. You sound like a teacher. 
Well, <laughs> like a middle okay. school teacher. How do I motivate these kids? <laughs> sure. And, you know, and I've taught at the college level and uh, taught an MBA course and, uh, and it is about communicating, but fast forward, 9-11 occurs, this new agency stands up first at the Department of Transportation and then in the Department of Homeland Security called TSA. And if you are a TSA screener at an airport, what is your metric of success? It's to be non-deficient today to not let anything bad happen on your watch. And so not knowing that that skill set and knowledge would be helpful 20 years later, I am far more empathetic with how TSA screeners have to do their job because of the experience that I had gone through earlier in this process of undergoing audits in the nursing home business. And um, consequently, you learn that people get motivated by different things other than that regulatory checklist. And that is a skill set that does translate. I promise you as a teacher, you know that the more time you invested in the students to let them know you cared about them individually and their circumstances the greater their capacity to learn the subject matter that you were putting out for them. Well, that was, that was one of the biggest uh, problems to solve for me yeah. was motivation. How do I motivate these students? And over nearly five years of teaching, I found out that relationship is the answer. And it's a slow process and you always start over fresh with new kids every year, but if you really want to motivate somebody, like you just said, you show them that you care about personal things going on in their life that maybe one day they come into your room at lunch crying and you actually listen and stop what you're doing. Uh, or other times you care about their grades and you show that you're going to go the extra mile for them. So I, I definitely, I definitely can agree with that. That's and one of the I big expressed. unknowns for, for all of us, not just you and me, but everybody is how do you build those relationship foundations at a time when you cannot be physically present with people? Can you do it electronically? Can, you, can teachers build the same relationship with students when you're doing it over a Zoom or Microsoft Teams uh, video platform? Um, or do it over a telephone line uh, after the classroom is over, as opposed to just sitting down and across from somebody and looking them in the eye. Same thing here in, in Washington mm -hmm. in terms of meeting with people in the government or people who influence government decisions. A, a video conference is good for conveying information. I have not yet found it all that helpful in building lasting relationships and and so it's a challenge to do what Dave Paulinson, the former head of FEMA, used to say, that you never want to swap business cards with somebody at the site of a disaster. You want to know them ahead of time and know what their capabilities are and be prepared. And I, I think it's going to be a big open question of how we deal with those relationship issues when we can't be physically present with folks. Yeah. Speaking of relationships, I, I know that you've got uh, a handful of clients. Um, I, I know many of them, but I'll leave it to you if you want to name them. But I want to know, obviously, prior to 2020, how did you go about acquiring such top-tier clientele? And um, I would imagine it's your charm and charisma, but I, I know that like many people in our family – being a connector is kind of a second nature sort of thing. But even then, how did you go about making those connections? Because I feel like for a lot of people listening, they may be stepping out into a new venture and think that it's some complicated metric or just a series of cold calls. But I know that from your experience, it tends to be much more warm and relational. So would love for you to share how did you go about connecting with those types of clients? I don't, I don't know that there is a single answer 
uh, to that. I just want your answer unless it's not a single answer. (laughs) It it clearly depends upon kind of the nature of the problem you're trying to address. Um, One is word of mouth and referral from other people. Uh, One is speaking at conferences and uh, seminars and kind of getting your message out. But under it all, what I have found to be successful is putting yourself in the other person's shoes and looking at how they define success. Uh, Years ago, Seth Godin, who's a marketing guru, wrote a book called Lynchpin. And in an, er- in, an, uh, in an era when information is available to everyone, how do you get, basically get people to write you a check uh, to help them uh, as opposed to just being their friend, right? Um, and his answer was to be a linchpin between the things that they want and need in order to be successful and what they then currently have. Um, so the lesson that I learned being in being the in-house lawyer and looking at things from a business perspective kind of proactively is that when we had to hire a consultant, it irritated me beyond measure that we were having to pay someone to educate themselves as to what we do. Um, And there are way too many consultants who do that. There are way too many engineers and technicians that want to talk to you about the capability of their technology or service or what they do without having any idea whether it would be helpful to the other person. They go in with this capabilities break. Uh, A perfect example of that is uh, one of the guys who stood up, uh, the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Director, it was a guy named John Kubricki. John was a great guy, DOD guy. His his hobby was seeing how many patents he could get uh, to beat his wife, who also was an inventor. And, you know, you, you just gotta be a little bit off center to have that as as your main hobby. <laughs> guy came guy came into John um, with a, a radio post Hurricane Katrina. Said, "Mr. Kubricki, with this radio, uh, first responder can not only talk to all the other first responders at the area of the disaster, but they could even talk to the fire and police departments in New York and Chicago and San Francisco." Uh, because we give them nationwide capability. Um, and here's our, here's our form factor. Here's our device, almost like a smartphone. And John looked at it and said, okay, that sounds really cool, but I've got two questions. Number one, why would anybody at the site of a disaster in Texas need to talk to a fireman in San Francisco or New York? And number two, have you ever been a fireman? And the guy says, well, no, sir. He says, well, my son is a fireman in Maryland, and to prevent their hands from burning, they wear gloves that are really thick, and they couldn't use the buttons on your phone unless they took their gloves off and risk burning their hands. And the inventor of this amazing piece of technology, looked at him and said, wow, I never thought about that. Now, how do you invent a phone whose customer is supposed to be a fireman without understanding what the heck firemen do and what they need and how they operate? And so one of the things that I have found to be a key to success is learning as much as you can about the client and viewing the problem from their perspective uh, and then addressing the problem from their perspective as opposed to trying to just sell some capability that I think is really cool. Um, and I, what amazes me is too many people come out of government jobs into the private sector to be consultants 
and without having that understanding of how clients actually work and how they make money. As you know, when we meet with anybody for the first time, within the first five minutes, we always ask, tell me about your business model and how you make money and what are the challenges to doing that? Because if you can't help them make money in a business setting, then, or prevent a problem that saves them money, then you're just a nice person and somebody it's nice to know and go have lunch with, but you're not going to build a business that way. That's the long answer to your short question. Uh, I mean, it ties perfectly into the, the next question I had, which is you now are a founder of an investment group. Um, one of many people in that investment group and it, I almost feel like I, I know the answer even just from this interview. Um, okay. So give me the answer. Well, I'll ask the question so everybody knows what well, in the world be, I'm thinking. No, let's play Jeopardy. You give me the answer, I'll ask the question. So then it sounds like, what is Alex? Rest in peace. Um, it, it sounds like because of now, domino effect here, the first domino would be the variety of experiences you've had. You then essentially a very non-romantic term would be your consultant to many different people in many different arenas. Yep. But that was to established companies, uh, more or less. Now you mentioned earlier, Travelocity had been a startup when you first uh, interacted with them and now they're a very well established company. But now it, it seems like your next step has been to now look at up and coming businesses and companies, um, I think it's more to do with your curiosity than anything that you want to see what's new, what holes are being filled, what gaps are being filled. And it's less about the investing as it is about the helping people solve problems. So they have this idea, they want to get it off the ground, they want to fill this gap somewhere and you in your experience, and I would assume your partner's experience in the investment group, you're looking to find the people and the products, the ideas to fill the gaps that not only they found, but is it a gap that you in your experience know to be a gap that needs to be filled? So does that even 80% answer the question that yeah. I was going to ask? Yeah. Yes, it does. Um, oh no, my audio went. No, nope, you're you good. Still, I can still okay. hear you. It, it, it went dead for a moment. Uh, the the real question is, David, in your role of trying to help companies, what does a technology scout do to look over the horizon? three to five years out and say, what do we need to do today in order to be prepared for something that's going to occur over the next three to five years? Uh, and so being curious, being able to find things that, and being persistent in searching um, and looking for patterns that maybe other people don't see because they don't spend the time doing that research. Um, I mean, that's, that's very much the challenge of every startup. And you've heard hundreds of stories of startups that started with technology thinking they were going to go down one path and having to pivot to a completely different path and then having to pivot again because the customers that they were going after uh, didn't pan out, but another opportunity, another use case fell in their way. Um, I enjoy looking and trying to do uh, something that Toffler Associates is really the world's specialty at doing, which is alternate futures planning. And looking at the what if and if then scenarios um, and what do we need uh, to have three to five years from now that we don't have today. Um, that is part of that curiosity. It's part of that persistence. It's part of educating yourself uh, about trends and not letting your own personal bias or desire kind of stand in, 
the way of the you know where things are going and that's one of the reasons I love working with startup companies and entrepreneurs they see things that I would never have seen uh, going back to the first advice surround yourself with people who are smarter than you are um, and we've done that in multiple areas whether it is brain research sugar-free ketchup uh, polling companies, uh, algae removal uh, entities, uh, uh, understanding how lease uh, deposits insurance uh, is changing the rental market. The thing that all of those things have in common is an entrepreneur who has a vision and wants to turn it into uh, a business case. And the areas where people like me can help are, gosh, here's an area where I made a huge mistake. I want you to avoid making that same mistake. Or maybe there's a different way of viewing your opportunity as to where you start as opposed to your current thinking. And it's just that alternate futures planning and technology scouting that appeals to me. And I'm sure there have been a multitude of times where an inventor, for example, comes to you and says, I have this great product. Here it is. And you look at it and go, this is fantastic. I have no idea what we're going to do with this, but you really put some effort into this. And this is incredible at, by itself, but there's no place for, there's no market is, and I would assume that's also maybe one of those times where a few of those have turned into a, a pivot type of situation where you say, okay, you're, you're close to a, a breakthrough market here, but what you're currently doing is not going to fit that. Could you pivot to X or Y? And I was wondering if there's an example you could give. Um, I don't know the, the type of, uh, type of like, uh, I don't know what the word is, censorship or something. You, you may not want to mention a, a particular company or whatever, but if you have an example that you could share with us where a company that you've been advising and consulting, they've had to pivot over the years that they've existed, maybe started off with one technology and had to now result in a totally different sphere. I, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to name a client, but I'll certainly name a type of technology um, and I, I mean, I can think of, of multiple uh, examples. Let me give you one. Uh, guy was in the military, uh, really smart computer skills, was asked to go help uh, build a building on a site uh, overseas. Uh, all that they had at the time were the CAD draw, I mean, the, uh, the blueprints, the printed blueprints uh, and a rudimentary CAD drawing. And so he built a um, augmented reality system where you could take the CAD drawings, put it into a graphic, visualize the, prod, the building on the site, almost as if you were doing Pokemon characters where you see these little things show up in a computer screen that may not be in your, you know, your eyeballs visual, but are, you can see them on the screen. You could build a building, change the roof, change the brick, change the deal, all of the data that flowed into that. And uh, literally you could place it in a spot and then visually walk around it and check it out. Really cool. Showed it to architects, builders. They thought, wow, this is really amazing but we have something that's good enough that we're currently using. And oh, by the way, we tend to build by the hour. And if we use your technology, then we will lose a lot of revenue. So a perfect example of something that people thought, yeah, it was really cool. Yes, we could use this. Yes, it would save a lot of money, but our business case does not uh, benefit us uh, when we save a lot of money because you're so disruptive, we would probably have to lay off a number of people. Well, one of the guys in our investment group had a brother-in-law that sold furniture. And the question was, well, if instead of doing buildings, could you sell furniture? 
And the answer was, of course, we can do any object, cars, hospital beds, doesn't matter. So working with furniture companies, you could then take items in a furniture catalog, build the graphics, put them in an augmented reality deal, and on your phone, on your iPad, on your Android, whatever it is, you and Elizabeth could look and shop for furniture, change the color, change the size, order it directly online from the manufacturer, thereby cutting out over 200% of the cost of that furniture that is typically incurred when you sell through regional distributorships and retail stores that have big real estate footprints. Now, that is a technology platform that is roughly the same, but the business model adapted to the changing environment almost on a, well, if you could do this, could you also do that? And if they had said, no, we're an, a technology company that puts buildings on property, they would have missed the biggest opportunity for what they were doing. And, and, and I think, I mean, and I could give you four or five other examples, but that is an example of how being open to other possibilities and pivoting to adapt to a changing circumstance will help keep you fresh. So as you're talking about this, I remembered that, and I'll show this to you um, for an audio only. Yeah. There's a, a view in your room option. Uh, if you're, cause I recently was uh, hunting for TVs on Amazon and there was a view in your room option. And, and Elizabeth was trying to figure out, okay, what is this TV going to look like in our living room? So I used that and you have to set it up a little bit and figure out where the corner of the wall and the floor are and all that. And then you, there you yeah. go. You can look at it. I took a screenshot and I sent it to her and she said, Oh, that's not at all what I was thinking. That actually looks perfect for our room. Sounds great. Is again, I, I know don't tell names, but is that the technology that has now trickled into Amazon that you're talking about? Um, or is it a different I know producer? That I, Amazon may be doing it differently, but I know that uh, it is a similar thing. Uh, the difference was is that basically our guys were first, um, and then as they developed, it created some knockoffs uh, and competition, and that is going to happen. Uh, yeah. And you know, the good companies may not be the ones that develop it first, they're the ones that learn to adapt to the changing market. For sure. I mean, well, it, but, but it's hard to tell an inventor that their baby who was beautiful when born, maybe not be as desirable as they thought. <laughs> that, I mean, a, a perfect uh, high notoriety case of that would be Apple in general. Apple is known for, taking a handful of different technologies that have existed for a while, they repackage it in a new way, put it together in a new way, and then sell it for a crazy price to their cult following, which I am 100% part of that cult following. But knowing full well that things that Apple markets better, call it what it is, they market it better, is not a technology unique to Apple. Other companies have had that for a while. Uh, it's just a matter of when they put it together. Even the stylus situation, the Apple Pencil that I think works fantastic with the iPad, a stylus is not unique to Apple. And in fact, Steve Jobs, I remember, was very much against a stylus. But given enough time, they came up with their own and said, well, this is our pencil, so it's different. And I, I think that speaks more volumes about the marketing uh, department of Apple than it does about the R and D uh, <laughs> department. I mean, I, I will I will leave you with one other example, uh, and that is a private company out of Cary, North Carolina, called SAS. Uh, S A S, and SAS is a software company, a data analytics company, maybe one of the best in the world, and for many years. 
they were uh, consistently ranked as one of the best places to work. When Jim Goodnight started that company, he, he was so customer focused that he said, we're going to cannibalize our own products and create a new product roughly every three and a third years so that we don't get stuck in this trying to sell yesterday's problem. We're always gonna be looking out into the future. And so if you've ever used SaaS software, you know that the product they sell today is different than what they had three years ago because they're constantly adapting. It is in their culture. It is rewarded to go in and blow up the existing product lines. And that is a very unique uh, concept in business. But that is what I think we need. That mindset is what we need in the security world. Uh, so uh, I've quit uh, giving examples and uh, stuff. But if you, if you think about the constant ability to adapt and look forward, um, I think that that will help people succeed. It, and Micah, as you well know, it's one of the reasons that I love baseball so much. When a major league pitcher throws a pitch that's hit out of the park for a home run, there's not a thing in the world he can do to get it back. He's got to focus on the next pitch and the next batter, and he's got to constantly look forward, building on the lessons of the past, not repeating the mistakes, but every new situation is going to be different, and that the lesson in life from baseball, the older I get, the stronger those lessons become. You are the only person in my sphere of people I know that actually makes baseball interesting to me. And Elizabeth agrees. <laughs> Even though she's a Cards fan because she grew up in St. Louis, but um, both of us were, were thinking, you know, if I interview David, maybe we should just talk about baseball. But I don't know enough about baseball to be able to really ask the, the great questions that I feel like are possible. Well, now you've got something you can learn about. <laughs> There you go. Of, of the multitude of things that, again, I'm curious to know, um, <laughs> that, is, that is now on the list. Right now, I'm just trying to figure out my own children. That's enough of a, a chore as is. Um, well, the great thing about teaching children about baseball is the greatest player in the history of the game failed six out of ten times he went to the plate. Who do you and consider so the greatest player? Well, I mean, it depends on if you're talking about batting or fielding or pitching or whatever. But Ted Williams had a lifetime batting average of, of 400, and um, which means literally that he didn't get on base uh, or didn't accomplish his – didn't succeed six out of ten times. He also played in a game where sacrifice for other players is rewarded. And that, and, and he has to play as a team. You can't play baseball by yourself as a, as a general rule. Uh, so you learn the skill sets of working with people who complement the things that you do. And if there's anything back, even when I was helping uh, one of my neighbors coach a little league team, and the players would be upset if they struck out or got thrown out or whatever. Uh, we pulled them aside and got the newspaper and asked them their favorite baseball player and looked up their batting averages. And not one of them was near 350, much less 400. And, and the question was, if your idol in baseball fails seven times every time, seven out of 10 times they go to the plate, what makes you think that you're better than them and they've spent their entire life working for it? And the answer is don't look backwards, look forwards. You cannot change history. You can reinterpret it, but you can't change it. So create your own. And uh, I feel like I've got a quote like that on a baseball around here somewhere. Actually, I well, exactly you probably, where it is. You prob probably do. It's right above me. Always yeah. look forward. Always look forward. <laughs> Given to Elizabeth and myself, uh, I think at our rehearsal dinner, if I remember yes, correctly. Sir. Yeah. What would you consider to be your greatest professional accomplishment 
so far? Because I know you and you're always looking for it as we just talked. So, so far, what do you think is your greatest professional accomplishment? And knowing you, I would imagine it's probably more of a mentality or a relationship than it is a thing. It would be hard to identify any one or literally any 10 things uh, because they're not specific accomplishments. It's being part of a team and contributing to uh, a billion dollar government contract to represent to helping get startup companies meeting with government officials Um, those are the last 10 when i practice law Uh, it literally could have been um, helping someone through a difficult personal time uh, whether it was helping defend a lawsuit going through um you know, medical issues. Um, I mean, I don't, I I tend not to look backwards at great accomplishments because I'm not so special, uh, but I do enjoy being part of a team that, where the team itself accomplishes something. It's, uh, Rich Cooper reminds me a lot that the people who are in the spacecraft that launch a Uh, from, uh, you know, go into space and go to the International Space Station or go to the moon are backed up by thousands of people who make things work. And um, I think the accomplishment that I've enjoyed most is helping other people succeed. So two questions to that. One, for for the audience, who is Rich Rich Cooper? Um, I know that he's one of your closest friends and has been for a long time, but uh, who is he? in the professional sphere. So Rich is a former partner, uh, native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, and um, uh, came to Washington, was in the private sector office of uh, the Department of Homeland Security when I first met him, uh, joined Catalyst Partners when he left DHS, uh, to this day remains one of my closest and dearest friends and Today, he's head of communications for the Space Foundation. He worked at NASA, helped create the teacher in space program, uh, actually uh, sent or has flags that were flying in the International Space Station on 9-11 because those were the only people off of the planet uh, on that terrible, terrible day. Uh, a great writer, a speech writer, uh, funny, uh, shares my curiosity about things, far more talented uh, writer than I am, but uh, a very dear friend. And uh, because of the work he's done at NASA and particularly now at the Space Foundation, we do a lot of things. Uh, I get invited to a lot of things where I meet some really cool people including uh, this past year, a year ago, Buzz Aldrin and uh, um, not Neil Armstrong, but uh, oh heavens, I'm having a senior moment, Micah, the, the to- uh, Collins, Mike Collins, the one who stayed in the spacecraft when uh, Buzz and uh, Neil landed on the moon. Really special, what, what really great, special people. What a great uh, couple of people to meet. And I, yeah. I can say from... I, you know, there's, there, is, there is one other thing, though, that I would add, and I, I really should say okay. this. Um, I had the honor of being on the planning team at the National Cathedral for the memorial service after 9-11. Uh, and we were given three days to put it together. And um, having every living president all but two members of Congress, the Diplomatic Corps firemen who came from the World Trade Center site, as well as the Pentagon with smoke still on their uniforms. Billy Graham spoke. Michael W. Smith uh, performed. Uh, uh, President Bush gave probably the 
the most incredible talk that I have ever heard. I, to this day, uh, I think that I get chills up my spine when I remember uh, Doug Major, the organist at the cathedral, playing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Uh, and to be on the planning committee for that, where we literally got like three hours sleep in three days and trying to arrange an event when there was no travel, the highest threat that we've been in in my lifetime. Um, and seeing that come off, uh, that, that is really a special moment in, in my life, at least, to be able to, to be a, play a small contribution uh, to what occurred. That's pretty incredible. I, I think that that could definitely qualify as one of your top greatest professional accomplishments or uh, I would say professional contributions yeah. so far. Uh, that would have been a better phrasing of that <laughs> question. Well, that's a pretty incredible. I, I think you've told me that you had a hand in that before, but I, I know you're not prone to talk about yourself too often. And if you do, it's usually self-deprecating. So um, I, I, I'm sure that's probably the most detail I've heard of that moment. And it's just two things I wanted to say, one about you and one about DC. Um, since spending time in DC, I've learned – and I remember you kind of smiled and said, you're exactly right the first time I told you this, but I learned spending time in DC that there are incredibly intelligent people on all ends of the politi political spectrum. There's also incredibly um, lacking people on both ends of the political spectrum. You know, growing up in Texas, which is typically a red state, uh, you kind of get the impression that if you're not a Republican, you're an idiot. And broadening my, my horizons and going to D.C., where I know that you personally have worked on both ends of the political spectrum, you have friends on both ends of the, the political spectrum, It it's more about, I wish that more people had that experience because I think that we would be able to unify a lot more often um, around common situations, if you will. And I know that even with 9-11, um, that was a, an incredibly injurious time, but also one of the most unified times that I can recall in our nation's history. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was one of the ways I describe you, and I think I probably told you this before, is uh, – First of all, you've mentioned by name a handful of people even during this conversation that I'm sure if we walked through all the positions that they've held and the type of offices that they've held, it, it would probably sound very impressive. But to you, they're just your friends. And the way that I've described you to people and even to Nathan, uh, my brother, who is kind of the unnamed special guest on every episode uh, or unseen and unheard, I said that David is like – the manager of a really popular band. If you two, which is pretty globally renowned, went anywhere, most people would at least say, I think I recognize that band name, even if you don't know who they are. Now, hardly anybody is going to know who their manager is, but other popular bands will probably know who you two's manager is. I see you as like the band manager of a popular band where all the bands, the popular people, the the names that you'd recognize from politics or TV or something like that, they all know you, but the normal person watching TV probably wouldn't know who you were. And I realized this when on a single trip up to one of the house buildings, it might have been the Cannon building, I'm not sure, we're walking down a hallway, and I think three different House of Representative members, congressmen, all addressed you by name and you address them by their first name as well. And I just thought this is a whole different level of connection just because you value relationship over position. And I think that that's something more people need to value. That's one of the reasons that I even started this podcast was to say, let's value authentic conversation so that we have authentic friendships, authentic relationships. So I just wanted to say in front of everybody listening that I appreciate about that, uh, appreciate that about you. And I do my best to emulate that every chance I get. Well, uh, if it works for you, that's great. And if it doesn't blame your mom, don't blame, <laughs> don't blame me. Uh, she said that uh, before I came to talk to you, I should remind you that uh, you owe her a lot of money from her piggy bank. 
Yes, of course What's I do. <laughs> yes, she's she's been interest. she's been complaining about that her entire life. Yeah. <laughs> By the Not, way, what is the what is the what are the what are the two letters that you learned in Washington that you did not know before you came here? Two letters? I mean, S, I remember. Oh, S A. I was thinking T L A. Everything's a T L A. No. But S A. No. For sure. Yeah. Essay for and everybody listening. Situational awareness. And now anytime somebody says that word, I both smile and kind of get triggered at the same time uh, because it was, it was drilled into me so much, um, almost physically, but maybe that was just my own impression of it. But TLA is what I just referenced for people listening is a three letter acronym. And I've learned that they aren't always three letters, but it's still considered a TLA. Uh, everything in government. And what is, what is, what is FLA? Oh, great. Five letter, four letter acronym. No, it's a, it's an abbreviation for Florida. Oh my gosh. And that's the kind of traps however, I fall into. However, <laughs> when I knew, I knew that I had succeeded in teaching situational awareness. When you called me from the steps outside of one of your classrooms, when you were still at Texas A&M, saying that you had, were talking to some of your fellow students and you used the word situational awareness and they looked at you like you had three eyeballs and four ears and uh, thought, what, what, what are you talking about? What foreign language is that? And at that point, you realized they had no idea what the surroundings were where the threats might be, where the risks were, how to escape if there was an incident, all things that you were trained on uh, kind of coming here that basically are skill sets that you can apply for the rest of your life, right? Yeah, and, and especially as a and parent. That's, that's, not a, that's not a bad professional uh, contribution either. Professional and personal. I was about to say, as a parent, you, you have to have a heightened awareness of what's going on around you. And I feel like so many people probably have situational awareness and just don't realize it's called that. Because I, I feel like most people, uh, if you have a small child playing outside, you're watching for cars constantly, you know, and that's a, a type of situational awareness. As we wrap up here, I wanted to ask, Two more questions, one a little bit lighter and one a little bit deeper. We'll go with the deep one first. If you die tomorrow, what do you hope people say about you when you're gone? He was a most curious fellow. And curiosity finally got him. <laughs> well, and, and, and you know, you want, to, you want people to say that you were generous. You want people to say that you... Uh, cared about other people. The name of our nursing home company was Care First. That was intentional because we wanted people to know that was the first thing that we did. God forbid you uh, ever do something not intentional. Yeah. Well, I, this is, that's the whole purpose of this podcast, isn't it? To have an intentional conversation yes. as, opposed, as opposed to an hour and 40 minutes unintentional one. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the fact that, I mean, I am firmly convinced that if if you want to leave a legacy, that is, leave something that is helpful to other people, instill in them a sense of curiosity and lifelong learning, a sense of persistence to push through adversity, which then will teach you to be resilient uh, and to have faith in the future. Uh, and the story I tell about that is that I was at a dinner in Chicago with a bunch of people on aging critical infrastructure, and we went around the room, and the, uh, everybody was pointing out all the problems and how we didn't think it could be solved, and if it did, it would take years, and we finally got around to Alvin Toffler, the head of, who founded Toffler Associates, wrote Future Shock and Third Wave, and a great, great forward thinker. And Mr. Toffler said, oh, we'll solve these problems. I have no doubt. Uh, we've faced adversity in many times before, whether it was World War II, Vietnam, the Cold War, 9-11. Uh, America is a resilient country when we focus on looking forward. And we walked out of the room and the CEO of the 
company asked me what I thought. And I said, well, I was surprised. The eldest guy in the room was the most optimistic. And she looked me in the face and said, David, if you're going to be a futurist, you have to believe there will be a future. And I think that that moment kind of crystallized all the thoughts that had been running through my head. Be curious, be persistent, be situationally aware, and believe in the future. And, you know, if that's, if that's a legacy I leave, it won't be about money or objects. It will be about lessons in life that will make people better. Love that. Um, so with that being said, you've already kind of given some encouragement. If there is any leftover encouragement for those that may be starting up businesses, those that may be trying to work in government right now, or just those of us going through life, what encouragement would, do you, would you give to those listening? And then last but not least, how could people best connect with you if they want to reach out? Um, and the easiest way to connect is uh, simply by putting our website on your podcast uh, notes, and that's the simple one. Um, and driving me nuts. Uh, the the legacy would be that when there is a crisis, that phone cannot. I I can't. It's, it's like four times. Uh, you can't, you generally can't affect the circumstances that occur in your life. You can only affect the way you react to it. And so the famous Mr. Rogers quote is that any time that a disaster occurs, don't look at all the people that are hurt. Look for the people who are rushing in to help. And even in the direst circumstances, look for the people who are designed to help. Uh, and that will give you hope. And there will be, you'll be able to get through it the best you can, knowing that there are times that bad things happen to very good people. Uh, and none of us are exempt from that. So on that very happy, upbeat note, uh, look for the people that go in to rescue, the people that go in to help. That's the encouragement I would give. I, I like that you said that and believe in a future. Uh, if you're, if you're yeah. believing that there will be a future, then that's inherently optimistic. Um, so I, I appreciate your time, David. I, I love that this was a great excuse for us to get to talk with each other. And uh, hopefully this won't have to be an interview style conversation again. We can just talk on the phone. Um, but I love you and I appreciate you spending this time with us. I know that a lot of people will benefit from hearing you talk about the variety of things you've discussed. Back to you and the kids and Elizabeth and the entire family and, you know, and the three other people that listen to your podcast. My, uh, <laughs> in, in cleaning out the office, Mike, I found a t-shirt from despair.com which reads, more people have read my t-shirt than have read your blog. Um, that's probably Fantastic. the most humbling thing that I've found in the, in the last two weeks. And, uh, <laughs> and it keeps you, ground, keeps you grounded. And, and, uh, and I appreciate all you're doing. Thank you so much. Yeah, I might have to get a shirt like that, but about podcasting. That'd be <laughs> a good frame of reference. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much, thank David. You. Have a wonderful Love day. You. Love you too. You too. All right. Take care. That was a great conversation with my uncle, as you have now heard multiple times. Uncle David, uh, he's also my namesake for my middle name, Micah David Brown. Now you know, now you can go steal my identity. But I, I love him for a multitude of reasons. I, I feel like many of those you probably now know uh, from having listened to this. He has quite the resume of a life the different variety of things that he's been interested in and then pursued as a job. So uh, I hope that for some of you that may be looking to get into government jobs of some sort, maybe now this gives you some light um, as to give you some information of what that may look like. It's about relationships. The most successful people are those who are 
building relationships for the sake of the relationship and not just to get something out of it. And then simultaneously, for any of you that are looking to start a new business or have a great idea for something, I feel like there's a lot of nuggets of wisdom in what David has mentioned here uh, that hopefully can give you a leg up on starting that new venture of your own. He mentioned that the best way to contact him is through their website. That's catalystdc.com. C-A-T-A-L-Y-S-T D-C because Washington D-C dot com. That's the best way to get in touch with them. Um, You'll be able to find out possibly some of their clients through that website. Uh, They're a fantastic company. David also has an investment branch through that. But if you contact him, you can find out more about that uh, privately with him. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this web, this website. What am I saying? I hope that you enjoyed this interview, this conversation with one of my favorite human beings on the planet. Um, and hopefully you've taken something away from this, if even just some encouragement from, from somebody who actually deals with mitigating problems and preventing them in the first place. He's actually a rather uh, significant optimist. So thanks so much for listening to this Micah Brown podcast episode. Don't forget to subscribe, share with everybody and anybody that'll listen. (laughs) And uh, we'll catch you next time, next week. Take care. Bye.